And um, in closed session, we will be doing 2.1 expulsion referral. We have two. 2.2 certificated public employee appointment, government code section 54957, 2.3 classified public employee appointment, employment, government code 54957, 2.4 negotiations update, 2.5 public employee discipline dismissal release leaves, and 2.6 existing pending anticipated litigation. And that's what we'll be doing in closed session and, and there's no comments obviously, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, welcome <laughs> to our meeting on October 23, 2019. Bienvenidos a nuestra junta de el 23 de octubre 2019. <laughs> okay, um, we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance, and I will ask, hmm, not too many of us here. <laughs> um, Maria. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I wanted to say to everyone that um, Kim DeSerpa is not here and she will be glad to tell you why at the next meeting. <laughs> and um, Jennifer Schachter, they've all called in. Um, Jennifer Schachter isn't here because her family is sick. I mean, not only um, her husband is sick too. So you can't help her. <laughs> All right. Tenemos un traductor aquí esta noche, Virginia Gonzalez. We have translation tonight by Virginia Gonzalez. Virginia Gonzalez. <laughs> um, so if you need support, you can talk to her. Si necesitan apoyo, se puede hablar con ella. Okay. <clears throat> now I'm going to have our superintendent, Dr. Rodriguez, and her comments. Yes, thank you. <laughs> well, good evening. So as all of you should know, um, and it's right behind us, um, our primary goal is to ensure that all students graduate college and career ready. And so as an entire district, kinder to 12th grade, we're engaging in college and career week that started October 21st and will end this upcoming Monday the 28th. And throughout the schools, you will see students participating in daily themes, classroom lessons, trivia contests, door decorating, guest speakers, and field trips. So como ustedes deben saber y pueden ver atrás de nosotros, nuestro objetivo principal es asegurar que los estudiantes se gradúen listos para la universidad y la carrera. Como distrito, empezando en kinder hasta 12 en grado, estamos participando en la semana de la universidad y la carrera profesional, que empezó el 21 de octubre y va a terminar el 28 de octubre. En todas las escuelas van a ver estudiantes participando en actividades diarias, lesiones en los salones, concursos de trivia, decoración de puertas, oradores invitados y también excursiones. In addition to school-wide activities, the, educa the Parent Education Department hosted a Building a Brighter Future workshop on Saturday. We have the UC Achieve event um, starting at 12.30 to 2.15 and Cabrillo's College and Career Night uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. both on Monday, October 28th. 
Además de estas actividades escolares, el Departamento de Educación de Padres organizó un taller ese sábado pasado para padres. Estamos construyendo un futuro brillante y tenemos el evento UC Achieve que empieza a las once y media hasta 2.15 y la noche de colegio y carrera de Cabrillo empezando a las seis hasta las ocho. Ambos van a ser este lunes 28 de octubre. So this past week we also engaged in Digital Citizenship Week. And each day that, that, of that week, we had suggested lesson plans for the various grade levels. And there is a different theme for each day of the week. Two of the themes were privacy, security, and cyber, cyber bullying and digital drama. So if those sound important to you, <laughs> then you can go on the technology website. So la semana pasada participamos en la semana de Ciudadano Digital. Cada día de esa semana eran lesiones de distintos niveles de grado. Había un temo, tema diferente por cada día de la semana y dos de los temas fueron la privacidad, la seguridad y el drama digital. So, si este parece inter, interesante para ustedes, pueden ir a la red al Departamento de Tecnología. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to have governing board comments. I'll start at the end with Georgia Costa. Thank you, Karen. Um, hello, good evening, welcome. Um, just a few quick announcements for me. Um, this, um, I did to attend the uh, State of the District event um, at the City Hall. It was great. It was a wonderful event. Um, I, I, you know, I just have one um, maybe just possible suggestion for us to consider going forward. If it would be possible for us to hold that event in the evening, maybe on a Thursday, so more community stakeholders could be present because I know even for myself it was difficult to manage the with work to have the time to be able to go. So, and last year I wasn't able because of a work conflict. Um, the I also, as a community member, attended the... Um, the um, Watsonville Aptos Santa Cruz Adult Ed Community Advisory Committee meeting where they had a very nice tribute to um, Rhea DeHart. And, um, and then lastly, just this last weekend, my family and I, we um, were able to participate in the um, Honor the Fallen run in Marina. It's a non-competitive run, but it was really great to be there and see all four branches of our U.S. military represented there. And um, even though it was non-competitive, Army did come in first. So um, anyhow, that's it for me. Jennifer Holm. I attended the PVPSA Soup for a Cause event, and it was great to see so many members of our community from all walks of life um, supporting the work done on behalf of our students. And I want to, I also attended the State of the District, and I want to extend a thank you to all of the classified, certified, certificated, excuse me, and administrative staff members who put in the work behind that event, not just on the day of the event itself, but in all the countless hours that went into supporting the progress that we've made in our district. And finally, I attended the Rio del Mar uh, Elementary Harvest Festival, my last as a, a, a Rio parent and then the Aptos High Homecoming Game, and congrats on their win. And <laughs> I, with both of those events, it's, it's wonderful to see how a school can really be the heart of a community and seeing you know, parents, students, and staff coming together for these kind of events. Maria. Thank you, Karen, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at tonight's meeting. I attended, along with my family, my two kids and my husband, the special ed conference this past Saturday. And um, I, I just want to acknowledge the staff and who, everyone else who was involved in putting together those workshops and that additional resource to our families, especially when it comes to uh, addressing the needs of one of our most vulnerable populations here at PVUSD. That Saturday, I also got the opportunity to visit the Migrant Make Academy. And it was great to see um, our students actively engaged in project-based learning. Um, so I was pretty impressed, given that this is voluntary and it does not a requirement for students to attend this academy. They did so, and it, it was an excellent turnout. I think we had a little bit over uh, 30 students present. 
on Saturday. Um, and lastly, I also attended the State of the District breakfast. I do want to echo what <clears throat> Trustee Holmes said as far as the collaborative effort that it has taken between certificated administration and classified staff in ensuring that our students are successful and that we're addressing the needs of our students properly. Thank you. Hi, um, so last week I attended our first Bring Change to Mind Club, which is a club designed to create awareness around mental health and to try to eliminate the stigma around mental illness. And um, on November 3rd, we're going up to Pinterest headquarters to gather with other clubs around our district and in like the northern coast to learn about like new ways to um, re like relax and relieve stress because school is like a very difficult thing and very stressful. And um, our president of this club, Francesca, gives all of the club members um, information about like resources that, I, that they need for this club and just if they need any extra help. And also um, they, our Bring Change to Mind Club is also implemented into our wellness center, which is very awesome. So yeah. Good evening. Um, glad to see everybody here. Just a couple things. The state of the district, for some reason, it just seems like a long time ago, but yeah. it, it was only recently. Um, I also attended the Watsonville High School Empowerment Conference. Um, it was 100, 200 students who showed up on a Saturday to hear about, you know, hear, to hear from some speakers, um, workshops, motivational workshops, mental health workshops. Um, then I also attended the E Hall Special Needs Conference. Um, it was a great event. I passed by with, with Baco. He's seen the things that are be, we're doing here at the district. Somehow I, I missed the Maria, and I accidentally walked into the migrant, I, the migrant, the big. Yeah, I just walked in on accident, and they were putting together cars with just paper clips, straws. Um, old CDs, and I, I thought that was really cool, and I want to learn a little bit more about that program. Um, I passed by the H.A. Hyde Carnival. You know, they had some games, and teachers were there, so that was pretty fun to look at. And also, real quick, I just wanted to say congratulations to Barbie Gomez. I believe she's been a bus driver here for 12 years, and recently she was recognized by the Pajaro Valley um, Chamber of Commerce for being a Woman of the Year. And i just like to say thank you, Barbie. I, I haven't personally known her that long, but within the, the couple of months that I've known her, you know, she puts together food drives, clothing drives, and when I, I, I really met her when she did the Relay for Life where she raised $100,000, and so um, I just want to say thank you. Yeah, yeah well, <laughs> for the Relay for Life, but just, you know, thank you very much, and uh, that's quite inspirational, so thank you. All right, of course, I went to the State of the District, um, and it was great because also Edward James almost was there again. He went to our board meeting, and he was there again. And um, we had wonderful speakers from the United Way, um, the director, our wonderful director from the PVPSA, um, um, Paco Estrada, our um, mayor was there, me, I was up there too. Um, so it was a really great event to be at, of course, and all the advances we've made already in this short time that Dr. Rodriguez has been here, <laughs> too. <laughs> so it was great. Um, I also went to the DLAC meeting. That's the District English Language Advisory Committee. That's for the, for the news. <laughs> news. Um, and um, they talked a lot about um, all their new members for DLAC and ELAC that they're going to have and the new members of DLAC that were there and gave them their notebooks and talked about you know all the things they need to learn about the bylaws of all those kinds of things a lot of the meeting was about that um, I did go to the adult education advisory committee as well quite a few of us went there and they did do a wonderful recognition of Rhea de Hart who was a teacher for 40 years 25 years as a president of the union and um, on so many boards and committees and uh, she was the 
president of the Adult Education Advisory Committee all the way until she passed. She was their president. <laughs> Um, and they talked about all their wonderful new programs, their, their career and technical education programs that they do for everyone, which were really great, and some of the new ones that they have now that they, they, they've just started, and I could talk about that, but it takes take me too long. I also went to the Migrant Head Start <laughs> meeting as well. I went to a lot of committee meetings. <laughs> and that, uh, I went to the Migrant Head Start meeting, and they talked about, well, all kinds of different stuff that they, they're dealing with. Um, um, even their budget issues and um, lots of stuff too. There, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, now we're going to have our high school representatives report, and we have here tonight. I'll start with Omar Casillas from Watsonville High School. She's. It's just a little late, but we'll work on that. Okay. There you go. Okay, so um, good evening, everyone. I'm, every, thank you for being here. I am. A, oh, where's the clicker? Oh, here it is. Sorry, I'm a mess. Um, <laughs> my name is Omar Casillas. I'm the representative from Watamo High School. And a little bit about myself I am the senior class president of class of 2020. Uh, I work with ASB, I'm in the mock trial team. I've also been a part of MESA. I'm really excited about mock trial this year. I get to be an attorney. Yay, yay for Omar. Hey, yay for Omar. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But moving on to the rest of the school. Uh, for, on September, we had our homecoming week and it was a really nice homecoming week. We started working on it since the summer. We had about 50 uh, students on average from ASB show up the week before school started. And it was really nice to see all their hard work pay off. We had one of the biggest turnouts that we've ever had in like the past year and that's uh, and coming from a school where like a lot of the students do come from like uh, low-income house houses it's really hard to like get students to dress out because it is like an economic barrier to get to them so it was really nice seeing all the students like put in the effort to like get dressed out and try um, it was also really nice to see like the freshmen the incoming freshmen um, enjoy it and see what high school like could be and like, how it can be it can have as fun moments apart from its stressing moments we also found it it was really ni a nice way to start the year because we had it a little earlier than we usually do and the teachers were a little stressed because of it ASB was stressed of it and it was just really nice to see everything turn out very nicely last week was the last week uh, yeah last week we sh we celebrated national coming out day and National Coming Out Day is a very important uh, day for us, considering we do have a pretty high uh, LGBTQ pop population at Watson, Ohio, and the lack of representation that they get in any other place is really low. They're making them a, a very low representative group. And it was really nice to commemorate them and like have them make a comfortable space and have like an in inclusive uh, campus come. We had our cross country uh, team come and like, some of them did come out uh, and like other like were just there to support as allies and it was really nice to see them. Our administration also made an appearance which was really nice to show the students that admin does care about them and like that they do um, that they do want to see the best of them and like ex uh, express who they are in every scenario on campus, not like just academically. Uh, as many as you know, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month, and Watson High really tries to do something. After our homecoming, we call our, this the time of the season of giving. And for this, we, we have our pink outs at our volleyball game and our football game, which are like our sports for the two, uh, our sports for the season. And we also, I don't know if you guys have watched the movie Mean Girls, or like have seen the reference to it. And like, there's a scene where Regina George says, on Wednesdays we were pink. So at Watson High this year, on Wednesdays we were pink. Today's Wednesday, and I know I'm not wearing pink. I did it for you. Um, <laughs> but regularly on Wednesdays, we wear pink, and we just try to really do everything. Uh, we also we all, uh, sell shirts and all the profits. Is, and you can see them a little in the picture. Miss Christina McLean has one on. It says, we support. And 
Uh, those shirts are, are for sale, but all the profits we uh, we donate for cha uh, Change for Change. And so far, out of just the shirts, we have raised $250. Apart from the boxes that we go around uh, at games, we have our ASB students like try and go out at every game and ask people if they have any change to donate. We have yet to count that till the end of the month, but we are very excited because people are very generous with their donations. And then, as mentioned priorly, this is College and Career Week, and at Watson High, we have our College and Career Center, which is really helpful, and it does have a lot of resources that help us with college apps. And it's because, like, well, like, a lot of us have never applied to college, and by a lot of us, I mean all of us. And, uh, right now, we're literally in the middle of our College and Career Week, and so far, seniors and sophomores have had our presentations. Um, as you can see, those that's the Mellow Center. We have them during advisory, and usually, like, one, one, at least one counselor goes and talks to us about like what are the uh, what like we should be focusing on right now for college and like what should be coming up or in the case of juniors like what should they be thinking about or what should they have uh, should they be talking to their parents am I going to which college can we afford which college can I go to or, and how can I get the help I want um, for, at least for my uh, presentation we had one of the counselors from uh, PV high school and he was really inspirational because um, even though his story did not start off the more traditional way he did not go to a four-year college right away due because he did not graduate from high school um he was he was a, a high school dropout but he was really inspiring to show the kids that um every like even though he didn't go the conventional way does not mean that he did not get to the finish line he did get his college degree and he said it was a little tougher and he encourages us to graduate from high school but he just wanted to let us know that sometimes situations are not the best for us and we should just do it and also this week we are promoting that the students wear all their college gear and during lunch, the co uh, College and Career Center are raffling out college gear and like giving out and having activities so we can be more inclusive with the students. Uh, moving on, um, our bathroom were remodeled. Oh, I only moved on on my screen, my bad. Um, moving on, our bathroom were uh, one, two, the four of our bathrooms were remodeled this summer and they're greatly appreciated because our bathrooms are not the best facilities. And um, it has been something that the students noticed right away and that they really appreciate it. The, those bathrooms do tend to be cleaner because they just look nicer and they're like one of those like things where like if something looks nice, you kind of just want to leave it nice. So we, ju we do notice that those bathrooms are taken a little more care of and we hope to see more remodeled bathrooms. And also in support of our LGBTQ community and commentary from the students, we would like to know more rules about what it does take to form gender neutral bathrooms and the rules around them so we can have more inclusive bathrooms for those who do not identify with one gender. Thank you very much. Have a good night. And we also have New School. From New School, we have Kimberly Lopez and Milagros. Milagros. Maciel. Milagros y Manuel Prado. Oh, my son, because you didn't spell very good. I mean, somebody didn't help me. You didn't. Milagros Maciel Prado. Hi, everyone. My name is Kimberly Lopez. I am the senior class president at New School, and this is um, Milagros Maciel. She is our secretary. Um, What's new? We have um, new, new school merch. Um, so we have new uniforms. And in the back it says, action, zeal, take, responsibility, earn it, care, and set goals. We have two new staff members, which are Mr. Bermudez, which is right over there in the back. He's our math teacher. And we have Ms. Tierney, a social emotional Counselor? Um, we um, have student leadership for the first time. Um, Kimberly Lopez, me, president. April Lopez, vice president. Saray Soto is our treasurer. And Millie Maciel is our secretary. Cool. <laughs> uh, this is actually our first time doing student led conference. And uh, Go ahead, tell us about it. <laughs> so basically, like, at the end of every quarter, like, there's a meeting. You send an appointment with your parent or the teacher, 
and you like tell them what you learned or what you accomplished the quarter if you got like all your credits and stuff yeah Uh, for Friday's act, for Friday activities, we had to digital nest science workshop, and some of some of the students head to the volleyball games. At digital nest, we take two different classes, which are photography class and coding class. In photography class, we learn how to work with lights, cameras, and Photoshop. And for coding class, we learn how to create our own website and learn how to code and learn learn tricks. For for volleyball, we head to Santa Cruz to play against other alternative schools' athletics. Um, so we do the outdoor science and character development every Thursday. Um, this this Thursday, we went to we went to Growing Up Wild in Coralitos, and basically, what we do there is like um, we do team bonding and like learn how to get along with each other. How did you do that? <laughs> uh, we do like activities, like activities. working in the creek as groups, uh -huh. collecting like little animals. Oh, to okay, <laughs> yeah, that sounds cool. <laughs> um, some of our highlights are um, our garden. Um, students, we yeah, we grow like vegetables, flowers, <laughs> stuff like that. Um, oh, the this. Watsonville wetlands. Um, donated water bottles to us, um, and then we uh, uh, we had eight students go to um, Coastal Cleanup. They collected they collected eighty pounds of trash, and they also appeared on. Uh, I forgot the website. I forgot the name of the website, but they were on the cover of it. And yeah. They were in the cover of their pictures and everything and all, all the stuff they did? Yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> and also, um, every month we, um, we, we, um, we pick two students to go to the, um, Rotary. And those are two students that went to Rotary this past month. And then we go to Science Workshop. And then we went to um, a Shakespeare play, um, our first field trip, and we made it on the cover of the um, newspaper. <laughs> and that's it. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. <coughs> now after we do the exciting things, we have to do the not so exciting things. <coughs> We're going to do the... Oh, because you didn't, you did not, no one told me about you, sorry. Anita Sanchez from Diamond Technology. I'm so sorry, they did not tell me about you. Um, so good evening, President Osmer, Board of Trustees, and, and Superintendent Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Again, I'm Ana Sanchez, the President of, uh, of ASV. Um, oh, wait, yeah, okay. So one of our first field work experience this year was to Carmel by the Sea, where we did an art walk. We explored working studios in class, paint sculptures, and photography. Our task was to connect a common theme between two different mediums. It was a fun and interesting day for all of us. So the seniors are starting to work on their FAFSA application as well as their college, which the majority of us have haven't finished since it has been a really stressful thing for us. It's new. And our counselor, Rob Roberto Zamora, has been helping out throughout the process. Oh, um, can you click on the link, please? Yes. There's Actually, one. if you can. I see it, and it's yeah. down here, right? This one? Um, yeah. It started 10 days ago as a brush fire in a remote area and soon exploded into the worst wildfire in California's history. The number, rising daily. the number of missing persons has climbed at an alarming and perplexing rate. The Northern California town of Paradise is essentially gone. President Trump has said no state. The they still haven't found my mom. Have you heard of Lost? No, no, what's that? Lost is an application that helps you find your loved ones. 
Um, so as you guys can see, at, um, this is one of the projects that that senior did, which were um, which this year all of the school is doing it. Um, we're entering in a competition for World Series of Innovation Challenge, and the requirements to enter that is to select a challenge, which or like we we need to select um, one challenge out of ten challenges that um, that's global. And then we need to make a commercial and make a product or and or a service that will help the people. Wow. Cool. Um, so La Pulga went well. All of our vendors made a profit, and we did as well. Mm -hmm. um, this year, our ninth, tenth, and eleventh grader took the PSAT. During testing, the seniors worked on a video project for Sutsu. Once. Testing was over. The entire school spent the afternoon team building. We had the chalk challenge and we had volleyball. And then we also put different types of games aside for them to enjoy. Um, so we're still nowhere close to raising funds for a band, but we're still not giving up and we're still going to keep on trying. So our goal will, will be accomplished by the end of the year. Also, stay tuned for our Halloween Spirit Week, or CSUMP and MPC College visit, on our CAS conference that a every ASB is um, or going, that ASB are going, our college and career fair, and as well our eighth grade charter school visit. Thank you. So glad you came, and I'm so sorry I didn't I found out about you kind of late. Thanks. <laughs> um, now we're doing the more, I can say, more boring approval of the agenda. So <laughs> I'd, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda with an amendment to move um, all items under eight report and discussion items, 8.1, 8.2, 8.3 to after 11 deferred consent. Do after what? 11 deferred consent. Um, there's a couple, if I may, um, community members present as part of um, item 8.1, and I know some of them do have to go home uh, fairly soon, so I would support the motion with the exception of that item. I would actually like to request item 8.1 to be moved after um, the approval of the minutes 5.1. I'll accept that amendment. And so we will move 8.1 to um, before item five, the approval of the minutes and- After. Oh, after, after approval mm -hmm. of minutes, I'm sorry. After, so before item six. <clears throat> and then we will move 8.2 and 8.3 to after deferred consent to item 11. Can I get, you need a second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? So it's one, two, three, four. One, two, three. No, she did, so it's one, two, three, four, five, zero, two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now this is 5.1, approval of October 9th board meeting minutes. Can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 5-0-2. And now we're gonna go to 8.1. It's our um, report about our foundation so it's going to be presented by Maria Rosco and other board members from our foundation okay good evening fellow board of trustees uh, president Karen Osmussen cabinet dr. Michelle Rodriguez staff community um, thank you for joining us today. So today I'm wearing a different hat, so before we dive into the presentation, I do want to introduce some of our board members who are joining us today. So with us we have Board Vice President and our treasurer, Jeff Ursino, 
who was a board member, <laughs> right, who was a former board trustee as well. And then we have um, our board secretary, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. And then we have board member, uh, Dr. John Grolty. And then some of our bo other board members who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight because some of them are sick too, something's going around. We have um, Casey Clark um, representing uh, Danny's area. We also have Ari Parker representing Georgia Acosta's area. And then we have uh, board member uh, Bonnie Dunbar representing um, Jennifer Shocker's area. So with that, I'm gonna um, get, hand over the microphone to John Grolty, who's gonna lead us into the presentation. Good evening, members of the board. It's a pleasure for me to serve on the Pajaro Valley Education Foundation Board. And I'm gonna go through a few slides with you here. Our vision, we believe that every PVSD PVUSD student has the right to an excellent education to be successful in college and career through easy access to creative and innovative proven programs in the areas of PK-12 academics, support services, informed instruction by invested educators, and scholarship monies to pursue a post-secondary education. Our mission, as it shows there, is to support the development and expansion of programs and extracurricular activities exclusively for PVUSD students in order to engage students and staff and provide equitable opportunities for students across the entire district to support both long and short-term investments in technology, engineering, mathematics, arts, and sciences, the STEAM fields. Provide professional learning opportunities for staff and award scholarship monies and resources to students who pursue post-secondary education. And we're well on our way, I think, to fulfilling that mission. And as any foundation has to do, we're perpetually raising money <laughs> to do those things. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, so briefly. Uh, current accomplishments, so we hosted our fundraiser at Holly Schools Restaurant, which was held on Thursday, September 12th, and it was an excellent turnout. We had over 75 people present. That didn't include the parents who were there supporting the student performers or any of the students who were there to perform. So um, I do want to thank the community because we received amazing sponsorships. We had, I think, over... 12 different sponsorships, including a $2,000 donation from George, George Owl. Um, and as you can see on the flyer to the left, um, there's just a, a list of the different sponsorships. We had Annie Glass, we had Martinelli's, the Friends of Watsonville Parks and Community Services, our three high schools who donated items for our silent auction. We had Fatima's Jewelry, among others. Um, so overall, uh, we brought in a total revenue of about $4,000. After expenses and food was covered, it was a total net profit of about $2,800. So currently we have about, I wanna say close to 3,500 on our bank account, if I'm correct. And so that's just in, I mean, the past couple of months. Um, so moving forward, uh, we do, as we're gonna cover later in the presentation, we do have planned um, additional events to keep, again, uh, fundraising. Uh, for the Fenny Ocean. We also hosted our Strawberry Festival. We had the Tamal booth at the Strawberry Festival. Unfortunately, we did not generate any proceeds from um, that fundraiser. But what we did walk away was a lot of, uh, with a lot of um, public support. So it was a great marketing tool that we utilize to our benefit in letting the larger community know about who we are, that we exist and uh, just building that additional community support. And last year, um, in June, we hosted our first annual Innovator of the Year Award. And so this is a really important event um, that we're also gonna have this year uh, because as we continue to recognize students' progress, it is important to acknowledge the impact that staff innovation um, plays in the success, in their success, and through this event, we were able to recognize over seven, 70, I wanna say, over 70 different honorees. Uh, we had over 200 people present celebrating their success and their acknowledgement. 
we had refreshments, we had a photo booth. Um, so it was really a, a really positive event. As part of our nomination process for this event, our board of directors asked school sites and departments to select one classified and one certificated employee who made con uh, significant contributions by virtue of innovative and creative strategies at their school sites or at their department. And in addition to that, the board of directors selected eight individuals from this uh, pool of 70 um, honorees, uh, one classified and one certificated from every elementary, middle, high school level, and department level to receive the, what we call the District Innovator of the Year Award. And these eight individuals received, in addition to the recognition, the $250 monetary award, which was also approved by the Board of Trustees. So we thank you for that support. Um, oh, the photos didn't show. Um, Well, the photos are not showing, but I was going to show you photos of the different events that we held, including the amazing turnout that we had at the Jalisco's um, fundraiser a couple of weeks back. Yeah, and so um, if, you, if you don't have access to the to to the PowerPoint, we'll forward that to you just for your reference. Oh, but it really was a, a a great community event, and so with that, um, I'm going to ask Jeff to continue. So, good evening, board. So at moving forward, as we look at continuing to raise money for the foundation, our, our second event will be at in, in February in Aptos at the Parish Public Brick House, which is one of my personal favorite restaurants. Um, we have not decided on a date yet, but there we will be serving dinner, wine, silent and live auctions, very similar to what we did at in Watsonville we'll have music student performance which is always good we're going to uh, we're going to be announcing a keynote speaker soon and on top of that we're going to have our second annual innovator of the year awards at the Mellow Center on June 3rd of 2020 so please put that in your calendar thank you great usually I'm not on this side <laughs> So some of our future projects, so we're just right now, we're finishing up on our website. So we are working with Digital um, Nest. Digital Nest has been working on this for us. Um, we're just doing some last minute edits so that we can actually launch it and people can see everything that we're about. We also are working on our social media site, so we'll have not only a Facebook, but also a Twitter and an Instagram that will be all linked together. Um, we continue to work on board recruitment. We're actually doing a really good job. Um, I have one additional group, um, one additional member that is slated by me. I've been waiting until the rest of the positions were fairly filled. So John is one of my positions. The other will be filled by who we call the Bermuda's power couple. So we have um, two of our teachers, so from New School and MSD, um, that are here, um, husband and wife, and they are going to be filling um, the second to last spot that we have. Um, and we're really excited. Um, we have, we really appreciate the perspective of having staff on the, on, on there. Um, and so um, we will have um, another staff member that will be there to um, be able to support. So at that point, um, we will just have one more position, um, one trustee area to be filled. And after that, we will have all the positions filled um, for the board of trust um, for the board of directors. Um, we also are going um, we're going to be doing our first annual pitch. This will occur hopefully in March. What this is is basically teams of, um, of high school students will get together. Um, we're working with Granite Rock, with, um, uh, with um, Second Harvest, and with Kaiser, and the students will be coming forward and hearing real life scenarios of problems that they have, and they will then come up with innovative solutions and pitch their idea. It's very similar very, very similar to what the student from Diamond Tech was mentioning, um, where they try to actually attack real life problems so there's and so it's applicable and meaningful. 
Um, this is something that they have done really successfully in the Virginia area, so the state of Virginia. Um, I was able to see it in person a couple of years ago, and I think it, it really, it not only helped the students, but it also helped the industry and helped make a connection with the industry. So we're excited about that. And of course, you can see John there, who is always um, there supporting um, at our breakfast um, that we had, our district-wide breakfast. Um, so we um, encourage everyone to continue to support the efforts. Um, we know that we can make an impact with the foundation. Okay, and so with that, um, we can take any questions, if there are any, or we can just move along with the meeting. Any questions? Any questions about the board? Yes. Uh, Maria, could you go back to the slide with, um, you had about how much you raised at Jalisco's, I believe it was. Yeah, that. So you'd mentioned on that, that so the 2,000 from George L, is that inclusive to the total of the 4,000? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I think my only other, um, thought comment and concern was that I know last school year and I, th I think this is in reference to the 250 monetary amount that the board had mm -hmm. voted on and I had voiced my concern at that board meeting right that this wasn't self supporting and when the previous governing board had voted on approving the foundation and all the components of it it was with the anticipation that it would be fully self supporting that the district was not to be in the position of having to help support it. So um, with that said, and with where we were last school year in supporting it, where are we at now? And are we looking at that we, the district, is not in the position of having to help support the foundation, that the foundation is on the path to being fully self-supporting? Because if not, just from a pure business perspective, I think as a governing board, we would need to address that. Right, and I think that's the goal, right? So that's why we have the different, at least the, the APTOS event coming up soon, mm -hmm. uh, because we wanna make sure that we don't rely on the district uh, to fund any of our projects moving forward. So we heard uh, that concern loud and clear from some of the other board trustees as well. So that is the goal. And uh, we're gonna do, we're doing uh, the best that we can to ensure that we don't come back and ask for additional financial support for the Board of Trustees. Yeah, I, and I just think that there needs to be consideration of a time frame with that, that, you know, with all things such as this, it's it, we can't just be like, well, you know, it's the first, you know, year, it's the first two years, it's then the first five years. I mean, mm -hmm. there has to be a very reasonable time frame, and I think now, this is now about, what, our third academic school year with the foundation. So it was um, actually think. found in November in 2017. So in November will be the second year. Right, and I was yeah. saying academic school year. So oh, yeah. we are in our third academic mm -hmm. school year, so. Yeah, and I think part of the reason why I think we had a, low, a, a slow start as a foundation is the fact that we didn't have enough hands on the board, right? Mm -hmm. So just recently, we actually were able to fill most of the positions. So moving forward, hopefully with the additional help, we're able to address some of those concerns. I definitely want to bring um, that concern to the board of directors, our next um, meeting, to ensure that we are able to provide a time frame for the board of trustees, because um, it is important. And by all means, we don't want to, the overall mission of the foundation is to bring additional revenues to the district, not take away. Exactly. So exactly. that, that's definitely and that, the goal. And that was, that's why I made the reference back to the governing mm -hmm. board, previous governing board that approved that that was under that understanding very clearly. And that's why it had my, you know, yes mm -hmm. vote for support. Um, and we don't have also, um, there is still no hired staff, right, within the foundation as of yet. Okay. That's good. correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. I just wanted to say thank you, you know, to all the, the folks involved who are here for the work that you're doing to you know, work towards supporting our schools. Thank you, John. And I, I just want to say that the event at Jalisco's was a very fun event. And um, <laughs> the students' performances were really super great there. And then just seeing everybody there, and, you know, it was a great event in Jalisco's. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Karen. All right. Thank you all. Uh, Wait one second.
So, so. But before we move on, I just wanted to tell the board that I got a, a note that Ros Rosanna Cruz, Rosanna Cruz, she's a, the, the student right here in the wheelchair, she wanted to address the board under non-agenda items. She has oh, a taxi right. that will pick her up at 8.30 and she wants to be able to speak before she has to leave, so I'm not sure. So we should do that next. Okay, I just wanted to read that out loud. So we're, we're on, we are on six now. Okay. So, Rosanna? Six, we're on visitor non-agenda items, so we're, we'd love to have you here. Yeah, thank, thank you. Good evening, Board President Osmondson, Board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Dr. Shannon McCord, and this is my 31st year with PVUSD. I've held four different positions with the district, but my most current position is as a program specialist supporting several programs, including our AAC, or Augmentative and Alternative Communication team. I've had the pleasure of helping the district grow and develop to having state-of-the-art assistive technology and A strategies that our students benefit from. I've worked under the guidance of several different SELPA directors over the years, and each of the women I have worked with has been innovative and supportive in allowing the team to become what it is today. We now have two district speech-language pathologists, Lindsay Kent and Autumn Shute, who specialize in AAC, both of whom have received additional training on top of their regular license. We are so fortunate to have these two experts who, in addition to supporting students on their very large caseloads, assist other SOPs who have identified students who may be ready for a trial with a speech-generating device. This is a very complex process that involves borrowing expensive high-tech equipment and is only possible due to the relationships Lindsay and Autumn have developed with reps from the companies so they will trust them with the devices without charging us. This eventually leads to Lindsay and Autumn saving the district hundreds of thousands of dollars as they pursue private insurance funding. It also means the talker belongs to the students so they're able to communicate in all of their environments and will take it with them if they leave the district, which is the ethical thing to do. It's a long process for each child, but worthwhile when the student feels empowered by the ability to communicate. The model we have established as our students receive devices is to provide an ongoing consultation from our AAC specialists and bi-weekly direct support from our highly trained AAC instructional aides. This model assures the equipment is supported in the classroom and in the language that is most appropriate for the learner. Our model requires dedication and commitment, but we've been able to provide more students with a voice in PVUSD than in the rest of the district combined in Santa Cruz County and reduce device abandonment. Our AAC team also provides ongoing maintenance and troubleshooting with equipment, district-wide trainings in the area of communication, facilitates training from outside vendors of devices, offers parent trainings in both English and Spanish, and helps coordinate our biennial gathering of students who use the devices to practice and socialize in a fun setting. Our next talker party is December 3rd, right here in this room, and we'd love to have any of you attend to learn more about our students and team. Thank you for your time. I know I had to present that pretty quickly, um, to be able to fit it in two minutes, so I also printed out my speech if any of you would like to read what I had to say. And then next, Rosanna would also like to talk to you about AAC. So let me see. My name is Rosanna. I am 18. I go to Watson for high school. I use my communication device since I was six years old. I couldn't live without my device to advocate. I am blessed and grateful to my AAC specialist. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next off, we have Melissa Dennis. Um, hello, I'm from Maloney Elementary School and I'm here to talk about the chromium-6 uh, in the water at my school. Um, chromium-6 is linked to increased risks of cancer. Um, recently, the teachers and I counted uh, five students who have recently battled cancer at our school. Um, our water has been tested many times with chromium-6 levels averaging 13 parts per billion. A healthy level for chromium-6 is 0.02 parts per billion or less. The most recent maximum contaminant level 
is 10 parts per billion, but either way you look at it, we are well above um, healthy um, levels of chromium-6. <clears throat> Our levels are so high, in fact, we qualify for free water service from the state water board. Our portables have no running water, so we already pay for our water service. Um, and we, if we accepted the state's offer for free water service, we could save money and provide all students with safe water. Um, representatives from the district um, came to talk to us um, recently about the water contamination issue and talked to us about having transparency. Um, since then, we haven't heard anything new or any steps that have been taken as far as solutions for moving forward um, besides uh, something that was mentioned when they came to talk to us, which is retesting the water. But we, it's already been tested many times and we already know that it's above health, it's, it's much higher than a healthy level for chromium-6. Our school librarian decided to contact Cal EPA Water Board herself and found out that water um, the Water Board has contacted PVUSD last week and restated that our school has been approved for water service. So I have just two questions tonight. My first question is, um, why are we not taking advantage of free water service to get uh, clean water to our students as soon as possible while we look for solutions? And number two, and more importantly, why have parents not been notified? Parents have a right to know what their children are drinking. Thank you. So the next three speakers we have is Phyllis Valoroso, Natalia Valoroso, and Rosanna Cruz. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, parent and mother. Good evening. Hi, my name is Phyllis Valoroso. My daughter Ashley has been using the talker, the Nova Chat, since she was in middle school. I appreciate, appreciate that Ashley has the device and I know that she does too. Before she had it, she would get very upset when she couldn't communicate. She knew what she wanted to say, but she couldn't. It was also hard for my family because we couldn't always understand her needs. She likes to be included in conversation for the, for the people to ask her questions and for her to respond with her communicator. She likes to order when she goes to restaurants independently and tell us when she wants to watch something on TV, be able to go to her communicator and point out what she wants to say and a lot more. Ashley receives support from the AAC specialist who adds new vocabulary to her device, keeps it working when there are problems with it. Um, she, and anytime she has any kind of issues, they're always ready to help. Um, and the program, uh, new pages on it, and they initially did the evaluation for her device. She's easily overlooked because she can be loud and has a hard time in the community sometimes because she knows what she wants and it's very, very smart. For example, we were at a party with people would come up to her and ask her how she was doing and she would answer with her talker. And a person came to me and said, how is she doing? And that made her very upset because the talker helps her to be able to communicate on her own. Um, sorry, missed where I was. Um, her talker helps her to express herself and let others understand her personality. She really loves to be included and if it were not for her having a voice, you would not get to know how much she really has to say. Thanks for your support. Good evening. My name is Natalia Valoroso and my sister Ashley uses a communication device. Her communica communication device is extremely important because she uses it to tell us what she wants, which, whether she wants to eat or watch television, and much more. If it wasn't for the AAC specialist, my sister wouldn't have learned how to communicate with her communication device. Before her communication device, she would get extremely frustrated with being unable to ask for what she wanted. 
The AAC specialist has helped my sister be able to communicate with me and many other people in the communi community. Thank you for your support. Thank you. <laughs> Rosana Cruz there? The last two is Sarah Dina Dino D. Benedetto and Dan Williams. Sorry. Hey. Can you hear me? Good evening, President Osmondson, board members, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, at the school board meeting October 9th, 2019, two speech therapists spoke about their experience with alternative augmentative communication specialists in the district. On behalf of many of our speech therapists, we want to express a different point of view and ensure that the board is aware that many speech pathologists in the districts do not share the same opin opinion stated by these two speech therapists. AAC is a relatively young and continuously evolving field. It wasn't until 2010 that graduate coursework was added to the speech pathology master's program at San Jose State University. And this course was designed as an introduction to AAC. As, it, as a speech therapist in the district, we serve students with a wide range of communication disorders on a daily basis. Articulation delays, language disorders, fluency, social language disorders, voice disorders, apraxia or motor speech planning disorders, as well as students with complex language needs that need AAC. We're very fortunate to have two licensed speech language pathologists in our district who receive training in AAC beyond their master's program. One of our specialists has six years experience on an AAC, AAC assessment team, as well as providing therapy to AAC students on, their, on her caseload. The other part of this, the year, the other was a part of a year long grant program that focus, focused exclusively on AAC assessment and treatment. This consisted of a semester on an AAC or an assessment team and a semester providing therapy to AAC users. It is by way that this training experience, experience that it is by way of this training and experience that our AAC specialists are able to work alongside the site-based speech therapist to implement the use of appropriate device for a child. This is the same model utilized in the medical field where a family practice physician handles a variety of ills but refers out to specialists for more complex cases. As professionals, we are aware that we do not possess the ext extensive knowledge needed to serve students with complex language needs and that collaboration with our AAC specialist is the only way to meet each individual child's needs. We would like the board to hear that we value our relationship with these specialists and feel that these services are indispensable. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Dan Williams, and I love working with children. I've worked with children for over 20 years in Texas. Now I'm located here in Watsonville, continuing my work with kids. And tonight I'm representing Child Evangelism Fellowship, along with my friend Lori over here. We both represent two clubs here in Watsonville. And uh, so I wanted to give just a brief um, uh, story about Child Evangelism Fellowship. It was founded in 1937 and has served children in the US, USA and all over the world for many years. And for those who are not familiar with what we do, here's a short description. Good News Clubs are offered in hundreds of schools throughout California and is a nurturing, welcoming, privately sponsored after school enrichment club offering training in morals, character, leadership, and citizenship from a biblical perspective. Through fun activities, projects, stories, songs, and games, all children are welcome, regardless of religious beliefs, and may only attend with parental permission. Attendance is free, and no donations are solicited. It is our desire to help support Pajaro Valley Schools in positive youth development and to contribute construct constructively to the programs in your schools, helping the children become good citizens and lead more productive lives. The curriculum that we use is supportive of and directly related to the mandate of California Education Code Section 233-5A, 
which encourages impressing upon the minds of students principles of morality, truth, justice, and so forth. Many of the things that are on this poster right behind the table. We are here today because our efforts to resume and or begin clubs this year at McQuitty Elementary and Landmark Elementary have either been delayed or denied. We are asking your help to encourage school principals in our district to open the doors to this fantastic program. Since Good News Club is youth-centered and charges no admission fees, I also hope that you will consider waiving any facilities use fees as you have done for the past 13 years. One more thing, um, on June 11, uh, 2001, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that it was legal for public schools to allow Child Evangelism Fellowship to provide its Good News Club as a means of after-school, biblically-based character instruction for public school students, and they must be given the same access as other community groups. So we need your help. The doors have kind of been closed to us, and I just would like to, just wanted to make that presentation tonight. Well, thank thank you. you. Now we're going to have employee organizations or unions, you might say, five minutes each. Um, the first one is Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Okay, she's going to speak on the normal. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. Doris. My name is Doris Takayama, and for the past 30 years, I have been a school psychologist for this district. And I am here today because I would like to extend a personal invitation as um, the uh, board um, approves um, item, action item 9.1, in which you acknowledge School Psychology Awareness Week, November 11th through the 15th. I would like to um, personally extend an invitation for you to contact and meet your school psychologist in your district. As a school psychologist uh, for 30 years, um, I just want to bring some perspective that um, Paro is very unique in that we are our own um, special education local planning area in which we serve students from birth to age 22 with all disabilities such as autism, severe uh, intellectual disability, multiple disabilities, uh, emotional disturbance, uh, hard of hearing, just to name a few of the 13 disabling conditions in which a student is eligible for special education. Yet, the um, uh, majority of students are referred to us due to a suspected specific learning disability. And I'm happy to report that we are now moving away from the discrepancy model. Uh, a week from Thursday, we have, thanks to you, uh, Dr. Rodriguez, and to Heather, we have Dr. Dend, uh, who is an author and um, presenter in terms of looking at patterns and strengths and weaknesses. I would love to talk to uh, the trustee um, at Mint, uh, in the Minty White uh, District uh, about how I use patterns of strength and weaknesses in order to identify students with specific learning disability. Perhaps uh, I could um, give you an assessment to see what is your phonological processing is, to see if you have maybe uh, dysphonic uh, dyslexia or maybe your orthographic processing might be a deficit, you might have surface dyslexia. And um, we have really grown in this district. When I came, there was 10 school psychologists. Now we have 17 credentialed school psychologists, two interns from Bradman, and we have a practicum student from CSUMB. And we have an MOU with CSUMB uh, because we really feel that this field, um, we need to get more young people into this field. Although I'm a career school psychologist, unfortunately, I have yet to find a student that tells me they would like to be a school psychologist. I almost had one student when I explained to her what I did, and the next day she came back and she said, I don't want to be a school psychologist. I want to be a teacher. And I said, 
that's fine. <laughs> so I want to uh, extend that and um, I hope that uh, you reach out to a school psychologist during uh, School Psychology Week, November 11th through the 15th. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, President Trustee Osmondson and um, Vice President Chair Trustee Dodge Jr., I'd just like to remind you guys of an important order of business. Um, 6.1, item 6, those are non-agenda items. So when members of the community come to speak to a specific agenda item, they need to speak at the point of that, and we just need to make sure we're following our order of business for our board meetings, okay? Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening, uh, Ms. Osmondson and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, and board, can I say that? Okay, it's, um, so it's wonderful. I wanna start off with just acknowledging our high school students who come in and speak. Um, so it's wonderful to see them um, play an important role in advocating for social justice causes like LGBTQ alliance causes and establishing student governments at their sites. It's incredible. And um, Omar was a student at the middle school that I taught at, so he was definitely <laughs> a, just a joy to see every day. Yeah. Um, truly. Um, <laughs> I also heard several references to um, our high school students uh, took towards counsel counselors. They're, they value, they appreciate and value their counseling and the guidance that they know, they, they, they know the, the added value that, that counselors um, give to their plan, their present and their future goals. Um, also valuable, again, are school psychologists. And so definitely it's great to see the resolution that's on the um, agenda and um, I hope you all just say yes. Um, we will. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we have, I think, 20,000, 19,000, or 20,000 students in our district. 20,100, and you just heard 17 school psychologists to serve all those, student, all those students, and two more, so 19. Um, and I'm sure that they are very inundated with assessments, and uh, uh, you know, that is just, just a part of the services that they provide. Um, so currently, um, we have a trio of PVFT members along with our um, sister union, the CSEA um, group, and the, the ad and an admin group attending a labor institute because we're working towards building trust and that together we so that together we can effectively make the educational experience better for our students um, and those who implement and support our students. So um, teachers and other educators at Sir, like Minty White and at Radcliffe, um, we've walked neighborhoods in this last spring to promote our schools. We have a lot of pride in our schools. Um, we have a lot of love for our students in our community. Um, and so we're hoping that as we continue negotiations, we are able to place value and I prioritize those educators um, in the classroom. So, you know, because todos unidos nos levantamos, and you know, so our students need our teachers and our counselors and our school psychologists and our nurses, and we need to have a school librarian in our district, ed code. Thank you. <laughs> I forgot to put my speaker on. So now we're asking for the California School Employees Association, their union. Is somebody here from there? I don't see anybody. Okay. Um, is there anybody that wants to talk about the Pottle Valley Association of Managers here, wants to say something? Anybody? Yay, Carol Ortiz. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. President Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm Carol Ortiz, Director of the Extended Learning Department here in PVUSD. I just wanted to let you know that tomorrow is National Lights On After School Day. It's a, an event celebrated annually throughout the nation in celebration of our students and our staff and our programs in after school as a safe and supportive environment um, for students to be in the evening hours. Here in our PVUSD, our 21 grant funded after school sites are celebrating events throughout the whole week. Tomorrow um, we'll have, we have quite a few sites are putting on events, so if you're interested in attending something, most sites will be putting on events around after 3.30, between 3.30 and 5.30 tomorrow. If you're interested in attending a site, let me know and I can give you the schedule. 
Um, I've also, this year we are giving students these lights on bracelets, and I gave you a bracelet and a copy of our press release and some information on our after school programs there in front of you. Uh, we give these to our students for two reasons, to celebrate our lights on after school and also for um, daylight savings time when it gets dark at the beginning of November, we give these to our students, especially those who walk home after school, so it won't be too dark for them as they're heading home. So I wanted, I gave you these, maybe you'd wanna wear it with your Halloween costume next week or give it to your kids. <laughs> if you need two, you have two kids and you don't want them to fight over them, let me know, I have extras. Yeah. And I just wanted to share our information regarding after school programs. Carol, can I ask you a question? Yes. Is that um, the L National Lights On event, is that always held annually on October 24th? It's always the, whatever, this is the third Thursday of the month? The third yes. Thursday of yes. October? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah, sure. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I've got Hi, my Hi, everyone. On. I'm jumping in real quick. I just wanted to do two things. One is just to tell you that a bunch of us are going out to and seeing a lot of great implementation of our new curriculum benchmark in elementary and then also English 3D in middle school. So we're really excited about that. I'm also excited about building a brighter future. I don't know if um, everybody knows about this great event that's happening this weekend. Uh, it's in, in conjunction with Cabrillo. It's happening at, at the Cabrillo office um, in Watsonville. And as our buddy Omar mentioned, it is College and Career Readiness Week. And this is all about college and career readiness. So there's these over there if anybody needs them. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, lastly, I've got the Communication Workers of America, which I never see. <laughs> okay, so I'm skipping 8.2, right? Okay. Okay, I'm skipping a couple of items and I'm going to 9.1. Um, I'm appro we're approving the resolution acknowledging, it's so great to hear from somebody who's a psychologist, we're acknowledging School Psychology Awareness Week, um, and it's from 19, what is the week? Okay, November, because it doesn't say, November 11th through the 15th. Thank you, thank you. Yes, and I'd like you to present it. Thank you, Dr. Okay. Rodriguez. Sure. So as we heard, um, they are significantly, the, our school psychologists are, are very important to our students and, and to our system as a whole. Um, the National Association for School Psychologists um, adopts a theme every year, and so this year's theme is um, find your focus. Um, and it can have a variety of meanings, such as paying attention, being able to see an idea more clearly, identifying an area of interest, or as we want to say, being persistent and determined in our efforts. Um, and so we're focusing on helping to set goals, identify action steps, communicate needs, and engage in dis um, discussions that help create the connections necessary for students to develop um, critical academic and social emotional skills. I think that's the uniqueness really about our school psychologists is they really look at all aspects of the child, not just the academic aspect, but also the social, emotional. The, when we talk about whole child now in the district, um, they really exemplify that. Um, so when you look at the resolution um, that we have here, I'm not going to um, do, do all of it, but I, I do want to do some of it, some noting um, what Nelly said that whereas 20,106 students at PVUSD, many benefit from these professional mental health services, engaging students at all level of learning and development to pr promote personal achievement, growth and resilience, and a sense of connectedness and well-being. Um, and whereas children's mental health is directly linked to their learning and development, and the learning environment provides an optimal context to promote good mental health, and whereas school psychologists help children to be, become members of teams that nurture their individual strengths across both personal and academic endeavors, um, we hereby would request that the Board of Trustees um, proclaims November 11th through the 15th as School um, Psychology Awareness Week. Thank you. <laughs> 
Okay, no public speakers no. to this item, right? Um, <laughs> uh, there was going to be one, but she spoke already. <laughs> and is there any discussion from the board on this one? It's pretty clear, huh? <laughs> okay, can I have a motion? Move approval. Second. There you go. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. <laughs> All those opposed? Okay, 502. So I can't go to 9.2. <laughs> I'm confused. 9.2 approve the addition of a special board study session on special education and addition of organizational meeting on December 18th this year, 2019 and by Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. So we had mentioned before um, about adding the special board study session on December 18th. There had been some concerns about doing it so close to the, um, the holidays. However, do, we weren't able to do it the week before December, the first um, Wednesday in December because some um, members will be at the CSBA conference. So that's why the 18th was, was selected. Um, you'll see attached to, um, to the document on September 27th, we received notification or a reminder from legal counsel that AB 24, um, 2449 um, now requires that the organizational meeting be held after um, December 15th. Um, and so um, because of that, um, what we had to do, so what it technically is during the 15 day period beginning the second Friday on December, um, after December. Um, and so because of that, um, so we have a regular board meeting that's scheduled for the 11th. That unfortunately, if you go to the second page, it speaks to it, but that unfortunately needs to stay because we must adopt our first interim report prior to December 15th but we're not allowed to have the organizational meeting until after December 15th. And so by because law. of, by law, so because of that, um, what it is is we will have our regular board meeting. We will do all the regular action items. We'll have the first interim report will be approved. Um, everything will be normal. Then on the, on the 18th, we will start with the organizational meeting um, and then we will follow it with the special board study session. Um, due to the regulation and them not aligning the change to the first interim report, there really is not another solution for us. Um, and so we're requesting the addition of the special board study session and basically the change of the organizational meeting so that we can update it on the public notification of future dates. Okay, no public speakers. <laughs> no. Okay, any I discussion a, from the board? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Michelle, is, was it not um, possible to, I, I understand the reason for the organizational meeting on December 18th. Was it possible and would it be helpful at all with the new um, task force if the special study session, I mean, the study session on special education, if that was put into January? Because in January, we typically have one meeting. I, would that be of any additional aid, benefit, help with this new task force up and going? Sure. It's totally up to the board. We are primed and ready to do it on December 18th. However, if it's the direction of the board, we, we can do it in January as well. January is we would have to determine the date that staff could be there so we do have a three-week break nice. um, part of um, what would, what had been requested is that um, teachers other staff would also be presenting a kind of a team approach would be presenting on the 18th having it on the 18th allows us because we're still in session to have staff there um, in january we would just have to pick carefully because Technically, a lot of people are still on vacation um, for many of those weeks, but I'm not saying there isn't a Wednesday that that wouldn't be possible. I'm just saying I don't know I would be able to tell you that date today because we would have to work with staff to identify when they're back from vacation. Just that week of December 18th, isn't that, um, that would also be finals week? 
Um, Would it not? Yeah. Um, well, the I certificated have, staff? We have, um, well, yeah, I guess so. I, I'd have to look at, it's the I, finals just, yeah. is the last week before we go on. I'm not, um, I mean, students stress out with finals. I'm not sure that teachers stress out with finals as, much <laughs> as students. Um, we haven't had any pushback to the December 18th date, okay. so we have spoken to staff about that date. Okay, and if you're saying that's primed and ready and it looks like it's good, I was just wondering if that would be any aid by pushing it yeah. to January. Yeah, we've been inquiry. doing a, a lot of work in between. Of course, there will continue to be more work going on, but yeah. Uh -huh. Okay, any more comments? Yeah. I just wanted to ensure that there would be enough time to cover, to deal with the organizational meeting and you know, the, the special study session. Yeah, um, well, Generally, the organizational meeting is pretty quick. We do do a short um, reception. Um, this would be an excellent time to talk about time if we would like to discuss time, meaning we had planned on six to nine, um, but we could definitely extend past nine. Usually a board study session, generally we have last about two hours because that's really when you're digging into something, two hours is pretty substantial time. Just cognitively um, so I think we would have a, a easy 30 30 to 45 minutes for the organizational meeting but we can extend that meeting if um, if we wanted to like we could talk about timing now um, because we don't have any new board members it's just the reorganization of um, our board members what takes a lot of time sometimes is the oath, and we won't be having any of that. So I wouldn't anticipate it taking longer than a half hour, but um, or an hour, we have an hour or two to do but it. But I, you know, we if we do it from six to nine, then we technically could have an hour. I have just a couple of clarifying questions. Do we have um, so based on what you're saying, we won't have closed session. Um, we would not have closed session. So at 6 o'clock, we'd start a public meeting. Mm -hmm. And then, um, but usually in December, we do have um, the student presentations and the performances. Would that be happening that night? December or 11th. Oh, okay. So that would be December 11th. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. We're, we're ready to vote. Is there a motion? I'll move. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 502. Okay, 9.2. So we're doing 9.3. Um, this is our really great thing that we get to do, save a lot of money. <laughs> E-rate wireless network upgrades at 18 school sites, presented by Dan Weiser, Director of Technology. Yes. Good evening, President <laughs> Osmondson, members of the board, Dr. Rodriguez. My name is Dan Weiser. I am the Director of Technology. Um, I'm presenting tonight for your consideration uh, wireless and wired and wireless network infrastructure upgrades at 18 schools. Um, this district is very fortunate to benefit from E-rate funding. These projects are 85% funded through uh, E-rate, which is a federal discount uh, funding program for schools and libraries to implement network infrastructure. Um, the other 15% is funded with Measure L bond funds. Um, PBSD, as you know, does a lot of amazing things with technology and all of that is dependent on our network infrastructure. Um, and these projects themselves make sure that every classroom, every school site has up to date, uh, cutting edge, fastest possible infrastructure to provide connectivity for all of our you know, mobile devices desktops and all of the other technologies that students and staff use every day. Um, this is the fifth year in the E-rate budget cycle. So this is the fifth and final year of the, of the funding that we're applying for. Next year, we'll get all new budgets that we can apply for. So you can see some of the amounts are somewhat small compared to the previous years, and that's because this is the final amounts that are available that we can apply for for each school site. Each school has its own individual budget that we can apply for for E-rate funding, and it's basically based on about, 100, it's $159 per student um, that you can apply for over the five-year cycle. So we're just basically making sure that we make use of every possible dollar we can use to support the network, uh, and then in also obviously using the, the Measure L bond funds to support that as well. So.
So once we implement these projects this year, next year we'll have all new budgets. So we'll hopefully be receiving much larger amounts of funding in the uh, following years, and then we'll be able to renew and upgrade all of the, uh, the devices, the network infrastructure at school sites. So um, unless you have any questions, um, we're hoping you'll approve the funded E-rate and Measure L network infrastructure projects at 18 schools. No public speakers. <laughs> okay, any questions from the board? Oh, yeah. No, I'll make a motion to approve the nine, item 9.3, the E-rate wireless network upgrades at the 18 school sites. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> That's all of us, right? <laughs> Five zero two. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, Thank you, John. Nine point four. Okay, this one's by Dr. Rodriguez as well because Chona is at the labor. Management, management collaboration meeting, which is down south someplace. Mm -hmm. So she's going to be doing all of the things which Chona would probably be doing. Dr. Killeen, <laughs> Chona Killeen. Okay, we're going to, in 9.4, we're going to approve addendum to memorandum of understanding between Santa Cruz, Silicon Valley, new teacher, um, new teacher, and then us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So you generally you've seen this and you've seen it for the over a decade um, just supporting our brand new teachers that have a teaching credential that's required for them to clear their credentials. So it's a two year induction program. This is actually an addendum which we are doing. Um, so over the years um, throughout the entire nation but especially in california there's been a lot of teachers that have begun their teaching career now on internships to support that there is a concern at the board level and frankly at the administrative level that how were interns being supported and receiving um, additional professional development because they were not part of this process because they did not have a clear credential or a credential yet so last year we started an MOU um, with PVFT to develop mentors. This will be an additional layer which will be provided by, um, by the new teacher project. So we currently have four specialists who are, which you approved at one of the last board meetings, which are out of the classroom and instead of being in the classroom, they're providing coaching to our brand new teachers. Those teachers would serve 33 pre-preliminary education specialists. Those are basically people that are on some form of BIP or STIP or internships. Um, and um, it would allow the teachers to get um, very rigorous um, support. So they would receive um, weekly coaching and then they would also attend um, professional development and um, be part of the forum process. Um, and so we'd, we'd appreciate you approving this MOU so we can continue to provide our um, newest of teachers um, with the support they need to be successful for our students. Mm -hmm. No discussion. No problem. Okay, any discussion from the board? Any discussion, any questions? Everybody knowledgeable what she just, about what she just said? <laughs> okay, you can move if you want to. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? 502. Okay, 9.5. Um, and this is another one of those kind of things as well. But we're going to prove the memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and California State University's Cal State Teach program to provide university intern placements. With Dr. Rodriguez. So as I mentioned before, there's a shortage throughout California. In order to be able to um, find the interns, we have to establish partnerships. So this is with um, Cal State Teach, which operates a program for education and training of candidates pursuing a California preliminary teaching credential with an EL English Learner Authorization, which is very important to us. 
So what this would provide us is university supervisors that pro would provide direct classroom supervision and support to those interns and mentor teachers. Um, they have to provide at least 144 hours or a minimum of two hours every five instructional days, so basically every week of support and supervision to the teachers. They, the university also guarantees that the people that they give us have met CTC, so that's the California teaching um, credentialing requirements, and that they confer with us um, consistently. So we would have still the sole discretion to hire those candidates, um, and we would basically place them on the intern positions. These are, and you'll see two coming up later on today, these are always individually approved by the board. So you know when we are bringing forward interns versus hiring teachers that are not fully credentialed. All right, thank you. Um, so is there any questions from the board? And this is pretty clear. <laughs> Okay, and we'd like to move approval. Second. 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 Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed, 502. Okay, um, oh, this is another one. <laughs> I know, 9.6, another one. Approve the appointment of teachers on provisional internship permits, as you had spoken about. Right. Yes, so as I mentioned, um, all of them come to the board individually as part is required. Their names and um, credentialing is actually public um, when you hire someone who is on an internship or some type of waiver. So here there are two different individuals. So it is Janice Elizabeth who is going to be a PV um, high school teacher, um, moderate to severe um, in the area of history. So what is unique, just really quickly, about special education is they're not only the grade level and um, special education, but they have a specific content area as well. So this wow. is for history. Um, she is currently enrolled in a credential program. She received her bachelor's degree from the California College of the Arts and does have a BA in drawing and illustration. Um, the second person is Mari Morin, um, who will be a preschool teacher for Duncan Holbert. So again, special education. Um, she currently is a early education um, specialist, or she's in the current early education specialist credential program and is expected to graduate next year. Um, she received her bachelor's degree from California State University, Long Beach, and she received that in fine arts, art, and illustration. She is currently in a master's for special education and has already completed 22.5 units of that master's. And so we ask for the approval of um, those two teachers on um, PIPs, which is provisional intern permits. All right, no teachers. So any questions from the board? No. Okay. So move. 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 Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Did everybody say aye? Okay, <laughs> 502. Um, 9.6, 9.7. <clears throat> oh, this is another one. Last one. I'm almost wow. there. Wow. <laughs> I saw that, but I... Okay, <laughs> this is another one. <laughs> this is also 9.7 approved memorandum of understanding between PVUSD and California State University's Cal State TEACH program again to provide student teacher placements this time. Not internships, but student teacher placements. Dr. Rodriguez. And you kind of already did my item. So this is the mm -hmm. same group. Um, however, so they do all the same things that I mentioned for the interns, but this is for people who are, have actually, um, they're going through the credential program and they're not seeking a job currently at this point, but they want to be placed as a student teacher within our district. This is very important to us because generally once they're with us, they love us and we grab them and we're mm -hmm. able to give um, contracts very early to our, our um, student teachers. So student teacher placements are very important to us. Mm -hmm. 
All right. Well, I don't think there's probably questions. <laughs> so you can move now. You can move. I moved. <laughs> Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? 502. Okay, now we're going to. We can consent and then we the defer. And then, yeah, you asked if you wanted to. Okay. Defer. Yeah, so, so, yeah, no, this is the confusing to put those things on here. Okay, so I'm going to the consent agenda um, and we're going to, looks like we're going to defer a couple of items. Um, so the question is, is there any deferral of items? Well, is, but I know there is. Okay, is there any items that the board wishes to defer? It's the eight point. Aren't we doing the eight point? No, that has already been done. We just reordered. We just reordered. Okay, so so there's no there's nothing we haven't we haven't. Oh, so, so I I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda unless any one of my colleagues otherwise would like something deferred. I'll second that motion. Okay, all those in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, I thought there was something there was supposed to be on there. <laughs> No, so, the, so now we are doing 8.2. Okay. <coughs> okay, so they're also, oh, I thought they were the deferred items or something or whatever. I'm confused. Okay, so we're now doing 8.2, which is the California Smarter Balanced Assessment Results and Local Indicators and will be presented by Lisa Aguirre, Assistant Superintendent of Curriculum and Instruction. <laughs> now. <laughs> uh, good evening, President Osmondson, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. I'm here this evening to present on our um, California Local Indicator Report and as well as our California um, assessment with the SBAC results. The California Dashboard um, contains reports that display the performance of local education agencies, schools, and certain student groups on a set of state and local indicators, measures, that identify strengths, challenges, and areas of improvement. Um, the California dashboard is made up of uh, six state indicators and five local indicators. This evening, I'm going to talk about the five local indicators that we, um, we input and we give the information that will um, lead to our California dashboard. Um, the first one is priority one, which is the basic services. This information comes from Williams report the SARC report, the FIT report. And uh, we just received our final set of reports from our final Williams visits yesterday. So this is hot off the press. Um, for There were no misassignments in the schools that were visited by the Williams team. Um, access to, for all students to have access to instructionally aligned materials, we had 100%. Um, clean, safe, and functional school facilities, we had five schools that were um, had exemplary conditions which means that for each school, um, there are roughly 13 um, different areas that are looked at and depending on every single classroom that they go into, whether it, the condition is in really good, which means that it's perfect, it has a little bit of um, area for improvement or it's really deficient. And so compiling all of the different marks based on the amount of classrooms that are visited, the percentage um, comes up. So we had five exemplary schools, um, good condition, 13 schools, which means that 90 to 98.9% per, of the checks were um, excellent. And then one school that was in fair condition with at a 89, um, and that school was at 85%, so which is still pretty good. The second priority is the implementation of state standards. It looks at how well that we are, um, have our professional development for our teachers. Our curriculum is aligned to the state standards and looking at um, how that we can make sure that we're identifying the professional needs of our um, teachers and our staff that not only align to the curriculum, but the needs of the staff. Priority three is in reference to parent engagement. This is about building relationships um, and partnerships between school staff and families to make sure that we have adequate input that drives the LCAP and also um, our different meetings that happen on campus. Um, through the parent ed office, 
There, we have 28 different opportunities for parents to engage with our school system just um, planned for this year. There are also many different organizations other than, or different departments other than the Parent Ed Office, like Extended Learning, um, Migrant Ed, that have additional parent um, opportunities where that um, parents can come and give input and also um, educational opportunities, lots of different ones. Um, and I listed a couple of the different participation programs that are up there. Also DLAC and all those kind of Yes, things. and so that's the parent participation decision making. The, that's um, ELAC, DLAC, School Site Council. DLAC, yes, yes. Um, priority six is about school climate. We really look at the Youth Truth Survey now since that it's within our district that gives us a lots of information. Um, and then we continue to also look at the Healthy Kids Survey to see um, with both of those, not only what our students are saying, but looking at what our um, staff are saying, and then also parents. And so based off of the, the information that we receive, we look at how we're gonna improve for the following year. And then priority seven is access to a broad course of study. We analyze, um, not, we look through, you know, Naviance transcript analysis, we look at the AP course offerings, the accessibility, how many students actually complete the AP courses, who's in there. And then we really look to make sure that our students, that we, not only do we offer a broad range of um, classes and courses for our students, but our students are accessing them. And then um, we look at always how, um, what classes that we need to add or revise um, to make sure that it is fitting our student population. Um, and so based on state indicators, and then also those, the six um, local indicators, priorities one, two, three, six, and seven, our California dashboard um, is comprised, and that, I'm gonna um, go back to the very beginning. So it's up here in the right-hand corner. So that was gonna come out our new one. This is the little snapshot from last year. So the new revised one to look at how we are doing with all of our subgroups as a district as a whole and our different schools, that's gonna be, um, that's gonna come out in December. So those are the local measures that we input and put in. Um, now for the state measures, and the first I'd like to say, um, give a really big thank you to Francis Whitney, who took time to put all this information together and in um, a slide, so I'll go through. Um, I think this is really um, what you really want to see and look at. And so if we look at it, this is our district. And this is student growth by grade level for English language arts over the last three years. So if you look, um, grades for grade three for English language arts, they've had an 11-point growth over the last two years. Okay. Um, and then fourth grade for English language arts, 18-point growth, and fifth grade, a 10-point growth. These are our highlights. Um, we look to see that some of the other grade levels, they're either flatlining or they're rebounding, and then our 11th grade um, has declined over the um, last three years, the 11th grade. When we're looking at this, we're not looking at similar, they're not the same cohort of students, it's, gr it's by grade level. So each grade level, when the students come in, there'll be a different cohort. So when we do see an upward trend, it means that it's not necessarily just the group of students that may be altering, it's actually within that grade level that we're pushing the students to a higher level. Um, so this is, if we look at our grade three um, overall as a district, um, we have it for the three-year growth uh, for all of our schools and the district level. The red line is the minimum for being at grade level. And so if you look across and how it is um, ordered by school, it's the last, it's the um, ranked scale score, um, highest to lowest within our district for the last assessment. There was a couple things that I wanted to um, point out to you. Um, I have a star by Alianza. And that is because if you look as we go through, Alianza is on an upward trend within all of their grade levels as we go through. Um, freedom and um, Landmark, this one it doesn't show, but they're similar on upward trends. And we had the leading with learning training for the last two years at their school sites. And the leading with learning training was through West Ed. It's one of the um, organizations that we partnered with. And it really looked at how to build um, how to build climates within the classrooms where students have collaborative conversations. How do we make sure that students are effectively um, communicating in written and oral form and making sure that those systems are in place. 
Um, McQuitty was our first uh, SIPS cohort. It was SIPS cohort number one. And um, Calabasas, and both of those schools are also showing improvement. So that's grade three. I'll go through them. Here's grade four. And if you notice in this, both Freedom and Landmark, the leading with learning. Again, the upward trend. And then Calabasas. The very last one is, um, I apologize for that. I had it. Grade five. Grade five what? Grade e English language arts. English, but it's, you're, you're pointing to a school grade five? So the grade five, it's all of our schools, and it's over the last three years. Um, and as I'm going to be showing you the grade levels, the arrows that are there, that's the leading with learning training, those that's the school, that is freedom, and then landmark to show both of those schools have had um, decent growth over the last um, three years. The red line, once again, that's the minimum level for at grade level. Grade six. And I apologize for being in a gray scale when it was transferred over, the colors disappeared. When we get to math, the colors reappear, and it might be a little easier on your eyes. So. Just, just to make sure that it's evident. So what we're, what we're showing is where we put attention, we are seeing results, right? So where we're putting in interventions, when we're putting in attention, we're seeing the, re we're reaping the results of that. Um, so whether it's SIPs, which we've done, which doesn't, hasn't got to fourth and fifth, so you're not gonna see that, right? Um, but where we put in money and attention, we are seeing increased results with those. And so as we expand to more schools with those pilots, we'll see increased scores as we move up. Mm -hmm. um, for the sixth grade with the middle school, um, we saw over the last couple of years that we weren't getting the growth that we wanted. So we're really focusing this year through the low performance block grant, which uh, Ms. Kristen Schaus reported on earlier this year. So that the Part of this year and um, next year, we're really going to be focusing efforts to make sure that we see the same upward trajectory for middle school. So this is the sixth grade English language arts over the last three years. Seventh grade. And, and that bar on the top is? The bar on the top represents the minimum a scale score of where you are at grade level mm -hmm. of the students. That is the, that is the bar to be at grade level in the seventh grade. Okay. In English language arts. A lot of Apologies if, if you addressed this already, but why is there a gap for PCCS? So PCCS, there wasn't enough students in the seventh grade um, during the 17, 18 year to account for scores. When you mean not enough students, I mean, because they have sixth, seventh, and there was also the gaps in the fifth, fourth, and I think down, is there a certain number of students that have to be, because I mean, they have those grades. Those there, grade are certain, there are a certain number of students that you have to have um, within the grade level to have an actual, um, to have where you could see the, the score. Okay. The individual students would receive the reports. Eighth grade? Eleventh grade? So there's shooting up in some of the places. What, what, what is the place that's shooting? Because I can't. I, I need glasses. What? Which one? The, 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 the third. The set of one you said. that's Aptos High School. Okay, well, they're shooting up there. And then the next one. But what we good. what we do see though from the eighth grade to the eleventh grade is that we see our schools that are a lot closer to that at grade level line. Right. They are. So within from the eighth grade to the eleventh, um, there is um, something that happens where our students start to close the gap. What we want to do though, and what we're going to do, is that we're never going to have that gap from the beginning, and we're going to attack it from the bottom with the SIPs implementation and other things, so that we don't have that gap in the first place where we're playing catch up. Because, but, well, there's, I mean, the majority, I mean, of those, they're either 
they're sitting right there on the bar or they're getting there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's what we want them to be, at that bar or above. Yeah. So, and the ones that are shooting up, the ones that are... Above the bar? Fourth, not the third, the fourth. That's... That's a diamond, that's diamond tech. Okay, because um, I need glasses, sorry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I need to put my glasses on. I forgot to bring my glasses. <laughs> yeah. So now we're going to switch to math. This is overall district um, data for the last three years by grade level. The highlights that we can see, grade four, we've had 16 points increase with, at grade four over the last two years. 15 point increase for grade five and eight point increase for grade six. If we go to, now we're going to go to individual schools. What we want to look, um, McQuitty, Minty White, and Calabasas continued to have growth even within the, um, the math. I uh, talked to a different, different members of the school team and then also of our math instructional coaches and our math coordinator to find out what specifically is happening within those sites. Some of the things that were reported, number one, that the teachers have been um, um, a lot more willing um, to really look at the instructional practices of the of bridges and um, be open the doors to instructional coaching, number one. Number two, there's a stronger implementation of, of our bridges curriculum on those school sites. Um, and then the other thing is really looking at the goal setting and having, stu having the teachers and the students really knowing that the all assessments and all, all the work that they do really matter and then showing up not only on the NWA MAP test but at the end of the year as well. Grade four, and once again the bar is where we want our, what we're, where we're aiming for and so we want um, our students to be at the bar or higher. Um, Amesti, they had uh, within their fourth grade, they had a strong implementation of ST Math, which is also one of the programs that we, um, our schools use and that is correlated with um, students really getting um, a, 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 fun, a foundational knowledge of the math, not just with fluency of memorization, but really understanding math on a, a very foundational level, which would have helped me in school. And then um, grade five, grade six, can't believe that was already that much time. Um, here's grade six, once again, um, if we look that uh, we're gonna be, focusing on 6th, 7th, and then we go back once again to high school. We don't have as close of a, um, a gap within the achievement at, at that red bar, but we will get there. Um, this year, is our last year was the first year that students went through our new math program at the high school. Um, and so we're, looking to, we're gonna look to see that once those students have had it for some time, that if it's gonna make a difference. Um, really quick, highlights. So this is the highlights for, if we look at, these are actual student growth. So this is not different cohorts, this is students, same cohort of students from third to fifth, how they're doing and how much more students are proficient at that they, their standards met or exceeded. Um, and then for that one, it was 11.36% increase in our students. The one growth area, all the, so if we look back, there's four areas, the reading, writing, listening, and research and query. For elementary, it was really, it was listening, where it was the largest growth area. How well did students understand spoken information? And so that, with the below standard, it actually increased. And so we're gonna look at what we need to do within the level to figure out how we can help that area. Um, for middle school, there was growth um, with the English language arts, and it was a 4.8%. 4.86% growth. That area, the growth area, was research and inquiry. And then mathematics in middle school, they had a slight increase, which was 1.65%. We're increasing our percentage of students. And in that area, it is the um, communicating reasoning. How well can students, not only can they do the mathematical problems, but how well can they communicate the way that they're attacking the problems and solving the problems? <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. <laughs> no speakers. So is there any questions or discussion from the board? Uh, Lisa, 
could you go back to the um i think it said the it was about almost your first slide or second or third i think it was like the it was on the local uh-huh i think priority one is it the one with the information on it's back further yeah that priority, one that priority one. one yes yeah so um because so you, there's five exemplary schools, 13 good condition schools, and one fair condition schools. So that's only 19 schools. Why is it only 19? So with the Williams, they don't do all of our schools. They identify and they let us know which of our schools that they are going to be visiting. So the 19 schools are the, um, the, all the schools that the Williams site team came out and visited. And they just randomly pick that on their end, and then they notify you that that's what we're going to look at. They, ran, they tell us they're visiting schools. Um, some schools are a surprise visit, so they even tell them that they're coming. Some of them are scheduled visits. It also has a criteria of, of the, um, the, the students that make up the population of the school. So Aptos High School and Aptos Junior um, are not schools that are visited as well as some of our North End Elementary schools. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and you answered my other questions during the presentation. Uh, so I just wanted, I don't know if is this the time to ask this question, but do we, do we have information about the Youth Truth Survey at this point? The Youth Truth Survey Act closes today. Oh, okay. So we're gonna have, um, we won't have it. We don't have the information right now, but we will get it fairly quickly yeah, for just, this year. Okay, so because I was wondering, I could ask you about that, but I said I don't know if we have it yet. <laughs> okay, because we were really working hard at getting, for example, more parents there's been a great concerted efforts of the school sites and I was checking that out today and a lot of our schools um, they have done a great job and we're gonna have a lot more um, parents who completed the survey and we are gonna have a lot um, so we're gonna have really good information because I mean I noticed when I went to all the open houses at the open houses they were really you know at the open houses that I really went to, and I went to all them, they were really working with the parents and giving them the surveys and having them sit down and doing the surveys right there at the open yes. house. So we want to hear thinking, our parent voices. So I was thinking, woo, this looks good. I bet we're going to have more <laughs> this time. We're going to have a lot more. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, we did something unique. We are the only school district in California that is doing the paper version. So we complained after the last implementation that we didn't have enough parents and we really felt even though we tried that the digital divide was was present. Yeah. Um, and so Alicia has the stack. She took a picture of it for me. So we have a stack. So all the school sites did allow parents to do it by hand by hand. And yeah, then we're paying a staff member to input it in. And we have a stack this big. Um, in our yeah, office so yeah. and um, just today I was at Ann Soldo for example and um, she was so excited because she's like I got another 15 I'm at 50% of my parents um, and so we we were actually doing really well on um, parent input this year so we're proud of the sites we really um, pushed it because we did not do well the first time. I know, so I mean, I'm, I just think the handwritten ones that they were doing, like for example, the open houses, they were all sitting down there and doing their written, you know, the, right there. And I was like, that looks good. Yeah, we don't, they don't need to do it in the internet. They can do it right here. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, thanks. <laughs> uh. Thank you. Thank you. I have um, a okay. question for you. Um, how we uh, delve into what's contributing to the decreases that we've seen in certain years? In certain years, or well, what we what we're really looking at is we want to go to the school level mm -hmm. to find out, um, and then we go by grade level to find out mm -hmm. where it's really happening, and then with the certain schools, and then we look at um, one of the things that when I went out and asked to try to find because, and this was just Francis. How long ago was it released, finalized? I think, and I think it was like, yeah, within, so it hasn't had a lot of time. Um, but one of the things, um, one of the grade level said is that they, it's been a consistent um, grade level team. And so it's been the same um, teachers able to collaborate and staying together. So there's different reasons and um, I am going out and with the team we're going out and we're really asking ourselves why, why it's increasing and why it's decreasing and what we think about those things and then we're gonna bring it all together and that's gonna help us inform our plans um, for next year. So when you do have access to that information, I will be interested in learning more about 
really okay, what's going absolutely. on at that level. Um, also, that those numbers obviously did increase our special ed population. It does include the special education okay, population. Got it. And um, and then you just touched briefly on parent engagement and the different things that we're doing to ensure that we get their input. Um, I think that's all for me. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. I'm looking forward to this one with both uh, with both Kristen Schaus and Casey Clappenbach. Am I saying that right? Okay. <laughs> um, and we're doing it on the updates on PBIS, social emotional learning, and anti-bullying measures reports. Good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, board president, board of trustees, and audience as well. I could not have asked for a better entrance than Omar as well as some of Stella's comments this evening in terms of what's happening with PBIS, SEL, and uh, anti-bullying efforts. And really, a lot of the focus this evening is that when you look at anti-bullying, it really is not about the policy itself that governs it. It's about what we're doing on the education side and the connection and belonging with students. So just a, a quick reminder as to where this fits in the large scheme of things. If you take a look at our multi-tiered systems of support, it runs on a three-level scope. So that tier one is really what we're looking at this evening. And where PBIS, SEL, and anti-bullying fit in is on the behavioral side of that MTSS support. The, the pieces that we're talking about tonight are really in that tier one, which is what are all of our students getting and where are we driving at to make sure that our students are supported foundationally. A few pieces that you've heard us talk about in spring as we were getting ready to launch uh, and a few updates as to where we're at. Uh, we are now moving from that NorCal Symposium Conference in the springtime last April to the state conference. We're taking over 60 staff that includes site administrators, counselors, and teachers that are teacher leads for PBIS on campuses. Uh, that is in Sacramento actually next week. So we'll spend the next couple of days, Monday through Tuesday, uh, working with staff and developing it. Watsonville High actually put through a presentation and was accepted as well, so they'll be presenting at the conference. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wow. Our middle school cohort, which is part of the low-performing block grant, has been working with some technical assistance pieces as well. Uh, we actually had a, a walkthrough piece this morning in relationship to PBIS and really looking at the tier one evidence factors of are we seeing transference in classrooms, what can we do to help support those pieces. Um, of visibility and really awareness of where we start with student expectations and are we teaching them explicitly. Five-star student uh, is that token reward systems piece that we were talking about that allows us to really delve into different subgroups and students that are attaching to our schools and connected and those that are not. Uh, that is in full swing. Uh, I wish Stella was here as, as well, but a prime example and modeling of that has been Aptos High. They've done a great job at launching it. All of our schools have had access to K-12, those scanners that are involved with Five Star to make it even more usable than just having cell phones, et cetera, uh, for, to offer students rewards and, and accolades for positive behavior. And then as referenced as well this evening, which was helpful, was the digital citizenship scope and sequence. So you're kind of seeing that, that trend piece of where those things are taking off. In the bottom right there, you'll see what those six module components have looked like, and those are also aligned now as well. So previously, sites would uh, pick and choose those pieces that they felt relevant, but it was really important to get to that tier one of how do we know what all three third graders get? How do we know what all fifth graders get? So that scope and sequence was actually developed through Common Sense Digital Media. We worked with Dan and his staff as well to make sure that we know what would that third grade scope look like? What would the fourth grade scope look like? So when we talk about cyberbullying, the materials are appropriate to that level as well. So can I ask, <laughs> just because I forgot to bring my glasses. Only if I get the time back. <laughs> <laughs> you will. So those, those things on the bottom, you were talking about them, so mm -hmm. I, know, I don't need to know exactly what sure. say, they say. <laughs> I forgot my glasses. <laughs> 
no problem. Uh, so down here <laughs> on the right-hand side, what you're referring to is uh, media balance and well-being. So that really talks about screen time, how often our kids are on it, how you're monitoring those pieces uh, to give you an idea. Digital, digital footprint is a huge one in our society for a lot of our adults as well that are finding themselves victim to the things that they did as youngsters online. So this is definitely that piece of looking at what you publish. This is not your open journal and your diary. This is something that will follow you and has followed several folks that, that have been, um, unfortunately, kind of, uh, for lack of better terms, run through things that they don't want to run through afterwards for decisions that they made as kids. So those are a couple of the, the modules that you see up there. OK. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So now we have ventured into a second grade classroom at Freedom Elementary. It's Mrs. Provencha's second grade scholars. And she is establishing brand new routines for Buddy Up and Meet Up, which is part of our new SEL Tier 1 curriculum for all of our elementary schools. And so you're asking yourselves, so what is Sanford Harmony? So Sanford Harmony is a tier one social emotional curriculum for all of our elementary schools. By December, um, every single site will be trained and will be implementing the program. And it's to really help our students um, actually build on and develop their social skills and be able to help them with their interactions and be able to speak up for themselves. Um, it helps them develop empathy, um, and other social skills. It also helps build that community in the classroom. So Chris was talking about um, really that preventative piece that before we even get to the bullying piece, if we can be that preventative and build that community of empathetic um, students, so it's actually building its way up. So we don't have those, those bullying issues um, across the board. And if they come up, then our students are able to stand up for each other and help speak up. And so now you're going to, um, I'm going to set the stage for our next clip. And it's actually going to be um, starting a meetup session. There's two main components besides the literature that goes with um, the Sanford Harmony curriculum. And these two components, one piece helps develop um, a classroom culture to be able to talk about um, issues and problems. And the other one is actually helping them come together and, and get to know each other individually. Somebody um, push 
All right, so just in case you were unable to hear that, this is part of their day where they're actually talking about their highs and their lows. So their students can, uh, can actually identify their feelings and discuss why it was a, a, a low part of their day. So if you missed it, Andrew was actually talking about um, playing football outside um, at recess or lunch recess, and he was not, um, the ball was getting intercepted, right? They were, the other team was getting the picks. And so I don't know if you noticed, but Mrs. Provancha actually, after he was talking about that that was the low of his day, right? She, she actually directed him back to their norms for Sanford Harmony and really back to their PBIS um, expectations of being able to celebrate the success of others and being happy for all. And so she turned, she made it into a positive for him so he could reflect. And it actually goes back to having a growth mindset, being able to celebrate the success of others and really learn from them too. An adjective that describes you like Emma said, colors. Now remember, adjectives can be internal about how you how you feel, how your art heart is, or external, what you look like. Okay, everybody, stand up. All right. So just 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 before she's sending them off <laughs> to, they're actually going to do an activity in the circle. And um, she's having them identify something positive about themselves and use an adjective. And it actually goes with our regular ELA standards also, which are character traits. And so we know that sometimes it's really hard for students to actually identify positive things about themselves. And so this is helping build their self-confidence. And then they actually get to share um, what they feel good about themselves, their strengths, and then others get to hear it too. So it's just part of. Um, one of the topics that they're discussing um, during this meetup session. And next, as I set the stage for our buddy up, again, this is where you're gonna see how they're just getting started um, for buddy up. Mrs. Provancha makes sure that everybody gets to be somebody's buddy, like they go through the whole class. So this helps them build that community inside their classroom and get to know students that might have not been picked first, right, or might not know each other. And that's, you, we know even as adults, once you know somebody on a personal level, it's more, it's, it's, it's more challenging to be mean or, or unkind to somebody, right, because you know more about them and, and empathize with them. but we're doing meet up today. Could you turn to your partner and give them a high five and knuckle bump or a hello in some random way? All right, so I'm, oops. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, obviously the students have been, you know, they do these routines all the time. And Mrs. Provancha has been talking about how it has really helped with the classroom culture. And there have been a reduced number of issues within the classroom um, setting also. And she's just been using it since the beginning of the year. And these are two of the main components. And so she's already seeing a difference. And so the last clip I will leave you with <laughs> is actually it's a topic that they're talking they usually talk with their buddy first and then they'll probably share around the circle also and they've been asked um, about what's something that they cannot live without and i believe this card that was picked has to also do with the unit that they're working on within the um, within the curriculum also
So a lot of the students identified family members that work really hard or other people or friends um, or even school. So you just saw us a quick little clip there. He was talking about his family members and how his parents work hard. And so as we move on to middle school, we have a new supplemental, also tier one SEL curriculum that, are, that um, all of our teachers have access to, and it's digital um, articles um, with topics that have to do with SEL. Um, so you might hear about um, self-determination, bullying, growth mindset. And so this is, can be differentiated. That means the reading material can be the same topic, but actually leveled for different students based on their needs. And so it can be used for, some, for a teacher to, to assign and then come back and have a discussion or to read together and then have a discussion as topics come up in their classroom also. And then site happenings. So all over our district, we have been working for on positive and supportive messaging, um, acceptance, and then really valuing our students' strengths and making sure that they know what they are and having strategies for them. So um, at Cesar Chavez, we have, um, they have um, the, the, my gosh, let it ripple. That's what it is. Let it ripple where it's ca character building cards. Um, over at Starlight, they have partnered with um, our friends at Kaiser Permanente, and they have peace signs, which is um, they come out and do um, preventative and anti-bullying assemblies and empower the students with, um, with strategies to be able to speak up for one another also. And then they go and do skits in the classroom and interact with the students and, and have them practice those strategies. We also, over at um, Rio Del Mar Elementary, they have been training their conflict managers, their upper grade students, to go out and actually help um, this, the younger students, right, solve those issues and use strategies to um, actually solve their own problems. And then we also have, again, we had that, that intro from Omar. Um, <laughs> So we had the um, National Coming Out Day over at um, PV High School, where they are, they are um, embracing and accepting one another. And then we also have, like I said, making sure that our students know and have their strategies and action plans that are visible. And then you can see um, a few others we have from one of our middle schools in the middle, our teachers are really working hard to make sure with messages when students enter their classrooms that they know that they are in a safe, welcomed place and that they are deeply cared about when they enter our schools. We also have Ann Soldo over there with Goodbye Bullying Assemblies and um, much more. I'd like to request two additional minutes if possible to finish out this presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so moving on from what actually uh, has been occurring and what you're seeing happening in our sites to address a couple of pieces that we looked at in spring of last year as well during our comprehensive school safety plans we did identify an area and a vulnerable area and that was our LGBTQ youth. Uh, a couple of the stats here that you'll see within this grid line and it was a study done with over 10,000 students looked at what are the actual factors that our LGBTQ uh, students are going through and how does that differ from those that are not LGBT identified? A few things that you'll notice up there, they're dealing with additional pieces that they would like to change, the tolerance and hate that they see, their family situations, as well as where they live or wanting to be out of where they live. In addition to the right-hand side here, you'll see the most important problem that they're facing within their own mindset. So you'll see non-accepting families, the issues and bullying and school issues that they have, and then the fear of being out or open. So drastically different in some regards and also complex in additional regards. So not only are they dealing with their top three, but where would their peers be going as well? And how do you deal with some of those pieces similar to what Stella was saying in regards to mental health and those things that are impacted in addition to uh, things that they're dealing with that are unique to them. What we have done is we've reached out to the LA Diversity Center as well. They have an actual national campaign that has gone live. It's called Out for Safe Spaces Project. 
uh, different than out for safe schools. So the project itself actually looks at how do you increase the visibility of allies within our campuses and the acceptance on our campuses so that students, much like Omar said, when they see a site member, when they see a teacher, that high visibility and that high need tells me that I'm accepted and that I'm engaged on your site. So that welcoming atmosphere is really what the, the mission of, of Out for Safe Schools looks at. It actually supports the supportive practices and policies we've already put in place and makes a statement and a demonstration to our kids that we are allies and supportive of them. In addition to being partners in this project, uh, what we end up getting is an access to a training platform that allows for professional development that also increases our awareness of what the issues are that our students are facing. Social networking platforms to talk to other districts of what that looks like. Um, and it also allows us to do Skype back and forth with LA Diversity Center and several other districts that are involved in the measure. So how are badges given out? And you'll see a, a sample badge of the front of one here. On the back side, you would see things that you could do as an ally to help assist students if they were to come up to you and be looking for additional information and hotlines. Uh, this does not replace our district badges, it actually complements it. So as you see teachers, et cetera, wearing their badges on the front of their person, this actually goes on their lanyard as well. And it's just kind of a constant reminder and symbol that you have a friend and you have somebody on campus that you can go to. So when does it start and when does it end? Districts actually can decide that. So as we've talked to secondary schools as well, it'll look at when we launch, we'll launch together and then really make sure that, that it is an open piece. And a lot of folks say, so when does it end? Well, it shouldn't. So the idea is, is that these markers and these symbols that we put in front of our kids stay with us because they're constant and continu continuity uh, symbols of our support, not a week or a month that we look at. So where does that put us? There are eight current California districts involved in it. You'll see some, some notable ones up there as well. Um, and then Pajaro Valley would be the number nine district within the state of California to be moving into this project. There's 23 nationwide uh, projects. Uh, most identifiable uh, would be Wisconsin has done an incredible job as well as New York has launched theirs as well. It also allows community partners that are partners with us to also represent within our community. But we do know that no matter how many supports and how many things are going on in our classrooms to help prevent bullying, our kids need different ways to be able to report. And some of the barriers that we've looked at in terms of, of what studies have shown is that 51% of the time when a student is confronted with the idea of filling out a form or finding the form uh, within their, their websites, that 49% of them are gonna start it right away. But if you look at this, this is really the telling sign. Only 12% of our kids are actually gonna finish that report. So a big piece of this question was, how do you inform and how do we give students another opportunity to be able to report? It should be quick, simple, allow for uh, anonymity involved in that reporting. Stop It uh, Solutions is an actual app. It runs on your cell phone. It works very similarly to a text platform, but it allows for anonymity with students. So a student could come forward and be able to text back and forth communication between a student any site designee. You can have up to five different designees, which means that your assistant principals, your principal, your counselors can be on that live feed and be able to work hand in hand with that student back and forth. And it's actually a, a protected database piece. So there is no, it's lifetime, which allows us to get to those information and those pieces quicker than waiting for a report to come in and that delay that happens. Uh, the interface also allows for us to, to move with a 24-7 monitoring report. So very similar to what we would have with Gaggle within our, our Google system. This actually allows the, the company to elevate crisis pieces that they see after hours. So if a student was to put a bullying incident forward, an incident of self-harm forward within that system, law enforcement can be one of your designees as well. So it would go to a district office rep as well as the site, as well as law enforcement, depending on the gravity of that situation. Right now, we've established feedback from sites initially, uh, specifically secondary, so our middle schools and our high schools, uh, and what that would look like in implementation. Uh, so we'll be doing more work around the, the collaboration of when that actually is pushed out to parents and students so that they understand what the process looks like. We just want to thank um, a special thank you to Mrs. Provencha's second grade scholars at Freedom Elementary once again. 
Thank you very much. One speaker, we're not sure if they're here, but we have uh, one Nick speaker. Morris. Are you still here? Okay, that, that's it. Okay, any comments from the board? Jen. So I, I loved the, the Stop It app, it was a way for you know, students uh, to you know, report you know, issues. I do occasionally hear from parents that you know they, they feel like that they reported an incident but nothing was done and that could either be you know something I've heard like through social media or you know a direct issue and understanding that any disciplines are governed by privacy laws what recourse do families have you know in terms of if they feel like their child's needs aren't being met Sure, I, I think in one of those pieces is, is that bullying doesn't just happen unless we actually talk to the perpetrator as well, and there usually is a history or a reason why they're a perpetrator. So, so part of that piece is the re-education of that student and also educating our parents on what that process looks like. Uh, we do believe in second chances, but we also understand that when the gravity of an incident isn't taken place, and we need to elevate that or move that forward, that parents certainly have an angst as to what happened to the other student. So as you said, it, it does become a little bit tricky, but there actually is information in terms of what that reentry looks like, and also if it were to elevate to things like a, a conflict resolution or a non, no contact order, those then kind of elevate in seriousness as to what it would look like, but I would also encourage that you know, as a parent, you're supposed to advocate for your students. So, so when you feel like you may have been stopped at, at the gate or you don't feel like you're getting a response to that bullying piece and those pieces of reteaching and those reentry pieces have already happened with another student, then I would absolutely support the idea that, that parents should reach out to another party as well to get some more information about what they could do or what they could help with. Absolutely. Georgia. Um. So with regards to the, the, the badges, mm -hmm. and, and you talked about the affiliations and the relationships that we have with LA in particular and other districts, I mean, it sounds like, is it part with the, the other seven districts or just LA? It, it's LA as well as the other eights, but it's 23 districts nationwide so far. Which, I mean, to think about just for the state of California, only nine school districts <laughs> out of over a thousand, that's very disheartening, really. I mean, you know, and none of us, in this sector and island unto ourselves, so that's that's a bigger issue. Um, but with regards to that, um, with the badges um, that you were saying, so site personnel can receive those badges, so they're identifiable, right, to students, like that's a person, right, a safe per like, okay. Are those personnel, I mean, are they getting any additional training in how to, to help these students to address mm -hmm. their needs? I mean, you, you know, just give any personnel a badge, but yeah, there's it's they a, don't have the tools. It's a two-step process, really. So those that are interested actually have what they call it's kind of a badge 101, but it, it gives them information about where do you start. You may be invested in the idea of wanting to help, but you don't know how. Right. So so part of that is on the back of the badge as well. It allows you, it gives you actually numbers to be able to reach out. So if a student is struggling, there's some national hotlines on it. There's also district services on it. And that part is really depicted by whatever the district decides that they would like on the back of that as well for resources. But it does give a breakdown as to what, what could your reaffirming language look like. So if you're trying to reaffirm or support a student, if you're not sure how to help the student, who on your campus would you help the student connect with? So it definitely talks about those two pieces. And then this piece also is supported through our Rainbow Alliances, our GSAs, our counselors. Um, and Mr. Fry is gonna be working uh, and taking on a, a good piece of that lead with our LGBT task force folks as well. But it is really, you can be in acceptance and still not know exactly how we're gonna support the students, but be able to get them to the right person. So that really is what the badge piece is about is, you can support it and still have some some key factors of reaffirming the students need to be able to talk to somebody and getting them to a person on campus that is even more seasoned than they may be in the issues that occur okay I, I just wanted to make sure because you know we've had those conversations in the past that just sometimes you know I mean a very well-hearted and good kind mm -hmm. intended person could have all the good intentions in the world but 
you know, not have the tools necessitated to help a student. And I think this is really important, especially with showing the, the other components about the things that were most concerning to these students, like saying to me right now, or if I could change, you know, and recognizing those components. The, you know, just, an, I mean, another thought, and this might be more directed to the superintendent. I don't know if that, you know, that just having only nine schools <laughs> out of the state of California and 23 nationwide. I mean, is there anything that, and, and given us and our size as a district within the state, isn't there anything that we could also do with our partnership and relationship with CSBA and NSBA to, you know, encourage an expansion on this and, and development of it at those conferences and at that level? I mean, one thing that we could do is try to get a golden bell off of it. <laughs> um, no, I think um, whether it's a League of Innovative Schools or it's our partnerships with Broad Foundation, all of those, um, we're having people more and more looking at what we're doing. And right. I, so I think being one of the spearheaders of this and being only the ninth is a great thing for us because um, we can show what's possible and then hopefully Youth truth survey data will um, increase. We'll see um, attendance increase, all these different things that are indications of good um, culture and climate will increase simultaneously. Okay. Um, and then, Casey, I just had one for you about, um, because you showed us what was going on at Freedom and you talked some about some stuff that was going on at Starlight and then Soldo. So, is, do we have, I mean, is it, do we not have a standardized curriculum across the base that's being the same at all the elementary schools, or is each school still kind of doing their own thing? Okay, so there's two questions there. So the Sanford Harmony, where you're seeing the video from. Freedom, is, yeah. Yep, and the curriculum is Sanford Harmony. So it's our core, it's our newly um, implemented core for, for social emotional learning. So it started, we just started it this year because we were recognizing that we didn't have one, right? Across and the board at all elementary across schools. Across the board. Including so by, our charters? So by December, including, they had, there was a different, you know, people were doing their own, Correct. sites had their own, or they didn't have anything. They were doing um, celebration, you know, different events instead yes. of a curriculum. So this is, this is our newly implemented curriculum for this year. By December, all elementary schools will have it. We have five more that need to be trained in it. Mm -hmm. And then the, the other question was, so I was also just naming some of the individual site events that we've okay. been doing for social emotional and, and learning and anti-bullying. Because that could vary site by site. But and the, it is. The, but the curriculum and the base, the core of what we're doing is the same. It's going to be the same for all elementary schools. Okay. All right. Yep. Because I know the other, that has been a, a complaint in the past. And so the other events, those are left up to the sites, but they turn in actually like a list of all their different special events, and they also, um, they also redo and revise their anti-bullying um, plans for their school sites also. And are those having to be approved at the district level by you? They get sent. They get sent in. They just they do their revisions and they show how they're implementing them. Yes. Okay. All right. Yep. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And so I want you to. So um. And, and PBIS has been, the PBIS has been trained at, I mean, every single elementary school now. I mean, at one point we didn't have it completed, but because, you know, I, in my year, I mean, the last year, whatever, I had, I had, I went to, to talk to a principal about a student, whatever, because blah, blah. And, um, and they said that they weren't completely trained on PBS, but that was that was almost that was a year ago. So every single school now has been the teachers have all been there. Every single elementary school is, is trained on PBIS, and they're implementing the PBIS. So PBIS is actually at every single one of I our mean, sites. Not the Stanford Arts, that's new, but the PBIS I'm talking about. Yeah, it's it's at every single one of our sites. K twelve. In fact, a large portion of Mr. Fry's work is working within PBIS. We have an SBC day coming up for our elementary folks, and it actually is our largest session of 
teachers wanting more and additional information. So as you know, it works on a tier system, which means that evolution of it's not a one and done training. It's as we've implemented pieces, we then have to train additional pieces. So those are underway and they're receiving additional support through that. And the numbers that we showed in terms of participants at the conference and those trainings, those yeah. include elementary staff as well. Yeah. So it's being, it's district-wide pretty much. There and you then go. The Sanford Harbor is going to be somewhat district-wide too. Oh. Elementary, throughout the elementary schools for the Sanford Harmony. So I have one question for you. Sure. Um, so as far as the application, uh, rolling out of the Stop It application, mm -hmm. when we, when, when is that going to be implemented or fully rolled out? So we do have, as you know, we have lots of initiatives and lots of additional work that we're doing. So we are working within our teachers groups of PBIS as well as our site leaders to determine exactly when the launch happens and the push happens. Um, goal will probably be by December, realistically, or that that first piece back when we come back from January, when we're resetting expectations with students, re-engaging folks, and folks have had some time to decompress, kind of move through the motions of, of where we're at, and then really relaunch with some steam. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the extension as well. Okay, thank you. So are, are we finished? <laughs> <laughs> we're pretty much finished. Okay, so now we're going to do just the close, close session um, report on the expulsions by Maria, and then Danny will do the closed session report. Okay, so the board approved a full expulsion for student number 1920-007 for the remainder of the 1920 school year with placement at another school outside of the district on a strict behavior contract. I don't recall what the vote was on that, but I think it was a 5-0. Five zero. Five zero. Thank you. Um, the board also approved um, the district administration recommendation for a suspended expulsion for the remainder of the 1920 school year for um, student number 1920-008 with a 5 vote. Okay. Board Classified and certificated public employment motion number one, closed session item 2.2. .2. I move to approve the certificated personal report as presented by district administration on October 23rd, 2019 with 11 and 14 additional action items. Move approval. I'm sorry. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion number two, closed session item 2.3. I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by district administration on October 23rd, 2019, with 12 and 17 additional action items. Second. I mean, well, somebody second. <laughs> second. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And that is it. Okay, then. Um, the next, our next, our next board meeting will be Wednesday, November 13, in the district office here, and it will probably be the only board meeting we have in November because of our, our November, our Thanksgiving vacation. <laughs> Thanks.